I'm here tonight to talk about social justice, critical theory, and Christianity. Are they compatible? Let me begin by thanking my sponsors. The Koch brothers, ExxonMobil, Monsanto, <laughs> the Knights Templar, the Ayn Rand Center for Logic and Intellectualism, and last but not least, 100% American citizen, Padmanir Vluton. Padmanir, I appreciate you. And I get it. You know, when I give this talk, people expect me to begin with a slide like this. Social justice is a postmodern Marxist, fascist, globalist, vegetarian, probiotic conspiracy. It's the biggest threat to democracy since the metric system. Yeah, that, that's what people expect, but I want to reassure you tonight, I'm not here to talk about politics. I'm not here to talk about how you ought to vote. My concerns are not political in nature, they're theological. Let me really begin with three cultural artifacts. The first is an exchange between Cher and Rosie O'Donnell, two entertainers with large social media followings. Cher says, Biden, Beto, 2020. Rosie responds, say no to Joe. Someone else asks, well, what's wrong with Joe Biden? Rosie responds curtly, no more old white men. Second, uh, in 2017, there's a horrific terrorist attack on the Pulse nightclub in Orlando, Florida. About 50 people were murdered by a gunman who pledged allegiance to the Islamic State. In response, a major activist organization posted this open letter, now taken down, which stated that the enemy is now and has always been the four threats of a white supremacy, patriarchy, capitalism, and militarism. These forces, and not Islam, create terrorism. These forces, and not queerness, create homophobia. Now, that's an odd response to a terrorist shooting up a gay nightclub. What does that have to do with white supremacy, or, or the patriarchy, or capitalism, or militarism? Third, here's a peer-reviewed paper on feminist glaciology. That's the study of glaciers, the large blocks of ice. And the authors feel that if we apply gender to our analysis of glaciers, it will lead to more just and equitable science and human ice interactions. Now, you could write these three artifacts off as these incoherent, random, bizarre uh, manifestations of political correctness gone wild, but that would be incorrect. I'm going to argue tonight that these three incidents are actually manifestations of a comprehensive and coherent ideology rooted in something called critical theory. If you want us to understand our culture today, or the woke movement, or uh, what many progressives mean by social justice, you need to understand critical theory. Now, why should we care, though, as Christians? Yeah, they're kind of crazy ideas out there in the culture, but why should we care in here in the church as Christians? Well, number one, if we're going to reach people out there in the culture with the gospel, we have to understand the ideas they're embracing, right? But number two, this is not just about people out there in the culture. It's about ideas that are coming into the conservative evangelical church. And that's how I got interested in this subject. Several years ago, I began noticing a theological drift, both in public figures and in people I knew personally. And it often began with an interest in social justice. Now, I thought that was just applying biblical principles to our laws and our government, which is a great idea. However, these same people began to display more and more unorthodox beliefs, and I couldn't figure out why. How do you go from saying racism and sexism are sins, which they absolutely are, to saying Jesus is one of many paths to God? I couldn't connect the dots. How do you go from point A to point B until I read this book? It's a 500-page anthology of writings touching on topics as diverse as social justice, Marxism, critical race theory, queer theory, critical pedagogy. When I put this book down, it's called Race, Class, and Gender. When I put it down, I remember saying, this is the most important work I've read in years. What I finally realized was that people were not simply adopting a few new beliefs about politics, they were adopting a new worldview, which was gradually eroding their Christian worldview, and that's why I'm concerned. I see more and more Christians today, especially young Christians, following the same path, and I want to prevent that. Okay, so let's ask next, what exactly is critical theory? That's an extremely complicated question. In his book, Beyond Critique, Bradley Levinson says that Karl Marx alone invites consensus as the first true critical theorist. Well, not his ideas about, about economics, per se, but his <laughs> ideas about how power circulates within society to produce and reproduce inequalities and exploitation. But Marx did not coin the term critical theory. That came from the Frankfurt School, 
a bunch of sociologists and philosophers writing in the 20s and 30s in Germany and later in the US. Uh, but that was like 80 or 90 years ago. Since then, critical theory has evolved tremendously to produce entire disciplines like post-colonialism, critical pedagogy, postmodernism, feminism, black feminism, queer theory, critical race theory. Here's a really funny graphic from Simon Van Loon's book, Introducing Critical Theory. They try to build a taxonomy or a genealogy of critical theory. So you see in the red there, you see Karl Marx right there. You see the Frankfurt School, people like Adorno, Marcuse, uh, uh, Walter Benjamin. But you also see neo-Marxist thinker Antonio Gramsci in one box. In one box, you see all of second wave feminism. In one box, you see all of post-colonialism. One box is all of black feminism. And there are about a dozen or so boxes downstream from Karl Marx. And all of this is critical theory. Now, what's worse is critical theory resists essentialism, meaning it's hard to say what exactly makes a critical theory critical. So it's a mess. Here's my brief picture. You can define critical theory narrowly to refer only to the Frankfurt School and their disciples. Again, Horkheimer, Adorno, Marcuse, and people that follow in their footsteps. But broadly speaking, critical theory encompasses all of these critical social theories, queer theory, critical pedagogy, critical race theory. They're all types of or manifestations of critical theory. So this is a mess, a complete mess. Is there a better and more fruitful way to approach the subject? I believe so. Look at these words, these phrases. Intersectionality, white privilege, white fragility, colorblind racism, lived experience, internalized oppression, heteronormativity. You've heard those terms before, I think, if you've been on social media or alive for the last five years or so. Well, where do these terms come from? At a minimum, they come from the scholars who either coined or popularize exactly these terms. Kimberly Crenshaw, Peggy McIntosh, Robin DiAngelo, Eduardo Benia Silva. Well, the question is, what discipline are these scholars working in? Well, lots of them. They are, they're in gender studies, critical race theory, sociology, queer theory. So what, are they, what, what ideology underlies these ideas? Well, there is no consensus term. Some people have tried to describe this. They say, well, it's cultural Marxism or identity politics or critical race theory. That's not quite right because it's much more than race. Or it's, it's neo-Marxism. It's, it's intersectionality. Well, but there's no one term. Uh, James Lindsay, Helen Pluckrose, and Peter Boghossian coined the funny phrase grievance studies to describe these, this ideology. But there's no, again, there's no consensus. So my co-author, Patrick Sawyer, and I, who's here in the audience, we've coined the phrase contemporary critical theory. Why? Well, undeniably, these scholars are writing in the critical tradition. It's unquestionable. And what's more, their ideas are having the most impact on contemporary culture. This is the manifestation of critical theory that's impacting our contemporary dialogue. But if you want to use a different label, that's fine with me. I want to focus on the ideas themselves, this ideology, not the label we use to describe it. Okay, so what are the four ideas that, have, that are the ideologies that produce these various words and phrases and ways of thought. I'll go through them in turn. There's the social binary, oppression through ideology, lived experience, and social justice. Let's start with the social binary. According to critical theory, or contemporary critical theory, society is divided into oppressed and oppressor groups along lines of race, class, gender, sexuality, physical ability, etc. So here are D'Angeli and Sensoy in their book, Is Everyone Really Equal? They write, for every social group, there's an opposite group. The primary groups that we name here are race, class, gender, sexuality, ability, status, exceptionality, religion, and nationality. They say a picture's worth a thousand words. Well, here's a picture. This is figure 5.1 from their book. You can see here the first column lists the minoritized or target or oppressed group, people of color, the poor, women, transgender people, uh, Muslims. The middle column lists various forms of oppression, racism, classism, sexism, heterosexism. And the final column lists the dominant agent or oppressor group, whites, the owning class, cis men, heterosexuals, Christians, etc. Here's another figure. This one is from Adams' Teaching for Diversity and Social Justice. They label it the matrix of oppression. They have various social categories, race, 
sex, gender, sexual orientation, class, etc. They list various, various privileged or oppressor groups and various targeted or oppressed groups and their various oppressions, racism, sexism, transgender oppression, and so forth. Now, the idea of intersectionality complicates this picture. Intersectionality says that our identities can't be understood on a, by a, with an a single axis alone. So a, a person can be part of both an oppressor group and an oppressed group at the same time. For example, a white female will be part of an oppressor group with respect to her, her race, but an oppressed group with respect to her gender. And so here's an example of that in practice. This woman here has a sign. This is from the Women's March of 2017, which was organized to protest the election of Donald Trump and to center women's issues. But she has a sign that says, don't forget, white women voted for Trump. Or the second sign says, feminism without intersectionality is just white supremacy. What both of these signs are pointing out is that even at an event wholly dedicated to women's issues, we can't assume that white women and women of color will share the same agenda because women of color are oppressed in a way that white women are not. So gender alone is not a basis for solidarity, necessarily. Second, we have the idea of oppression through ideology, or what's called hegemonic power. What on earth is hegemonic power? We hear our Senso and D'Angelo again. They say, hegemony refers to the control of the ideology of society. The dominant group maintains power by imposing their ideology on everyone else. This is crucial. Traditionally, oppression is understood to refer to acts of cruelty, injustice, violence, and coercion. But contemporary critical theorists expand this definition to refer to other ways in which the dominant social group imposes its norms, its values, and ideas on society to justify its own interests to support its own power. So this is a really important essay by Iris Young. She writes this. In its new usage, oppression designates the disadvantage and injustice some people suffer not because a tyrannical power coerces them, but because of the everyday practices of a well-intentioned liberal society. Oppression is embedded in unquestioned norms, habits, and symbols. And I'll skip quotes from Langman, Delgado, Bonilla Silva, uh, all of these slides are available online. You can just don't take notes, it's fine. I can give you the URL later. Uh, but they say the same thing about hegemony and how it's oppressive. And this explains why, by the way, why are old white men the canonical oppressor group? Demographically, they're only about 15% of the US population. They're, they're actually a minority, but they are not minoritized because they have hegemonic power. The idea is that they are a dominant group because they have the power to impose their old white male values on society, and we all accept these values as natural, objective, and common sense when really they serve old white male interests. So that's why they're a, an oppressor group even though they're actually a numerical minority. Third, lived experience. Contemporary critical theory argues that lived experience gives oppressed groups privileged or special access to truths about their oppression. Here is philosopher Jose Medina quoting Charles Mills. He says, hegemonic, dominant oppressor groups characteristically have experiences that foster illusory perceptions about society's functioning. In other words, dominant oppressor groups actually blinded by their privilege. In contrast, subordinate oppressed groups have experiences that at least potentially give rise to more adequate conceptualizations. Okay, well, here's Charles Lawrence. This is writing an, article, an essay on critical pedagogy. He says this, we must learn to privilege our own perspectives and those of other outsiders. We must learn to trust our own senses, feelings, and experiences, and to give them authority, even or especially in the face of dominant accounts of social reality that claim universality. See, what he's saying again is that the, the oppressed person needs to trust his lived experiences, shed light on social reality, which oppressors are generally blind to. Here's a phenomenal quote from, Adam, uh, from Anderson Collins. They write, the idea that objectivity is best reached only through rational thought is a Western and masculine way of thinking, one that we will challenge throughout this book. So here's a picture to help you understand what they're saying. The idea is that 
Privileged groups tend to be blinded by their privilege. That's the top figure here. They have both conscious and subconscious reasons to deny or ignore the reality of oppression. In contrast, by virtue of their social location, oppressed people might be able to achieve what's called a liberatory consciousness. Colloquially, they can get woke. They can realize that dominant social norms are just attempts to justify oppression and can thereby achieve a more realistic view of reality. Um, but that's not automatic, right? Because we're all socialized into the dominant group's ideology. So these ideas we take for granted are actually, they seem to be common sense. But, so they can experience, even as oppressed people, they can experience internalized oppression where they have actually internalized and embraced the ideology of the dominant group, failing to realize that it's just an exertion of power. And finally, social justice. Contemporary critical theorists are fundamentally concerned with social justice, which it defines as the elimination of all forms of social oppression, whether it's impression based on a person's gender, race, ethnicity, religion, sexual orientation, physical or mental ability, or economic class. Um, this is a great quote from feminist Suzanne Farr. She writes, these political times call for a new dialogue about and commitment to the politics of liberation. Liberation requires a struggle against discrimination based on race, class, gender, sexual identity, ableism, and age. She's writing that in 1996 at the height of the Clinton presidency. These sentiments were amplified just a little by Trump's election. Okay, and I'll skip the quotes from Collins, from Bell Hooks, but they're saying the same thing. The central goal of critical, contemporary critical theory is to achieve equity, social justice, liberation of these groups from oppression. Here's an extreme example of that. A few years ago, there was a, a rally and an Antifa uh, member hit a Trump supporter on the head with a bike lock, not because he was being violent, he was just talking. But, his, but the Antifa member was trying to resist oppression. And the funny thing is that the guy, the guy who committed the assault was actually, he taught ethics at a local university. So here, even moral imperatives like you shouldn't hit people with bike locks are considered to be less important than abstract goals like resisting fascism or resisting oppression. Now that's an extreme example, but it shows how this idea that social justice is the, is the ultimate goal can trump all other goals and, and moral concerns. Now, I hope I've convinced you that understanding critical theory is very useful for understanding a lot of what's going on in our culture today, in the media, in politics, everywhere. Um, but before I talk about the bad side, the negatives of critical theory, let's talk about its positives. So first, contemporary critical theorists are right to identify oppression as wickedness and evil. The Bible from the Old Testament to the New Testament, from Genesis to Revelation, says oppression is evil and that God calls his followers to resist oppression and to overturn and dismantle injustice. Now, major caveat, what critical theorists call oppression may not be oppression at all. But let's be clear, when the vulnerable are being abused and when the powerful are taking advantage of their vulnerability, Christians should absolutely work to stand up for the rights of the vulnerable. Second, critical theorists focus on groups, not on individuals. So because of that, they focus on ways in which systems and laws can promote sin. Now, they're right to do that. For example, chattel slavery in the US or the Holocaust should not be analyzed only in terms of individual people doing evil things. In fact, in both cases, society had created entire systems and laws which codified sin into practice. And the law shaped human moral intuitions as it always does. So of course, people were individually responsible for their sin, and yet that sin was enshrined and codified, and it was amplified by these systems, which encouraged human wickedness. A good example today would be something like abortion, right? We do want to change individual hearts about abortion, yes, but we also want to dismantle unjust laws. We can do both at the same time. And finally, hegemonic power does really exist. It's not imaginary. And it can have an insidious effect on how we uh, think about our norms and values. Here's an example that will resonate with conservatives. 
Think about how hard it is as a Christian parent to teach your children that beauty is not merely external. <coughs> Why is that so hard? Well, it's hard because they're bombarded with images from Hollywood, Madison Avenue, from TV, music, magazines that teach them something totally wrong about beauty and sexuality. That is hegemonic power in practice, right? So we recognize it's a real thing. Okay, so having described some of the positives of critical theory, let's talk about its, its, its conflicts with Christianity, and they are manifold. So first, the most fundamental problem with critical theory is that it functions as a worldview. A worldview answers basic questions about life and reality, questions like, who are we? What's our problem as human beings? What's our solution to that problem? What's our primary moral duty? Critical theory answers these questions with a, with a meta narrative, a story arc from creation through fall, through redemption to restoration. Who are we? Well, we're the creatures of a good and holy and just and loving God. What's our problem? Well, we've rebelled against that God. What's the solution? Well, God needs to rescue us from outside. He needs to redeem us from our sin. We are helpless in ourselves and will one day be restored to God and to each other. That is the meta narrative, the story arc of Christianity. Well, critical theory tells a very different story. There is no creation element within contemporary critical theory. That's very important. We do not, our identity is not primarily as God's creatures vertically, but as members of various social groups competing for dominance, right? What's our main problem in life? Not sin, but oppression. Certain groups have used their power to subjugate and exploit other groups. The solution, activism to either throw off the chains of the oppressor or to ally yourself by divesting of your own power and privilege to promote and lead to the, the goal, which is equity or liberation or social justice. So these two ideologies offer extremely different answers to our basic questions, and that's a problem. We're gonna be forced to constantly choose between critical theory and Christianity in terms of our values, our ethics, our priorities, we can't combine the two, it's not gonna work. A good example of how we have to choose which will be our reigning dominant paradigm for understanding the world is shown by this series of tweets from Union Seminary. A few years ago, John MacArthur wrote a statement on social justice and the gospel. This is a response from Union Seminary. And their first tweet says this, that we deny the Bible is inerrant or in infallible because it contains both God's truth and human sin and prejudice. Well, wait a minute, how do we tell the difference? How do we know what in the Bible is sin and what is the truth? They reply, biblical scholarship and critical theory help us to discern which messages are God's. So you can see very clearly there, I appreciate their clarity, but they're saying critical theory is the lens through which we evaluate everything, including the Bible itself, okay? That's a problem. Second, epistemology. Um, normally when people make a claim about the truth, make a truth claim, we ask, what is your evidence for that claim? We ask, what is, what is your reason for believing that? What's your argument? What's the logic behind it? Decades ago, C.S. Lewis christened another very popular but fallacious way to approach truth claims. He christened it bulverism. Bulverism takes a truth claim, and instead of talking about the evidence for the claim, it shifts the discussion to the person who's making the claim, their identity their motivation, their hidden agenda. Why would you say that? Oh, it's because you have this goal in mind, right? It's it, it, it just a discussion from the evidence and the argument to the person's motives. Well, critical theory does a very similar thing. Uh, it bypasses the question of whether the claim is true and shifts the focus of the discussion to the claimant's group identity. If the person making the claim belongs to an oppressor group, the answer is easy. You say, oh, of course you'd say that. You're just trying to maintain your power or privilege. But what if the person making the truth claim belongs to an oppressed group? Well, in that case, you can accuse them of suffering from internalized oppression. You say, oh, you've so been so immersed in the dominant power structure that you're unable to even recognize it. You're just parroting back their ideas. But in neither case do you have to either examine the evidence or argument or reason or even scripture. That's very dangerous because if a person from an oppressor group says, I think that view is unbiblical, you can, be, you can dismiss them as trying to maintain their power. If someone from an oppressor group says, I think that idea is unbiblical, you can say, ah, you have internalized oppression. For example, if I say, 
I think abortion is immoral. They say, oh, you're a man. You're just trying to control women's bodies. If my wife makes the same claim, they accuse her of having internalized oppression. Do you think that homosexuality is a sin because you're homophobic? You're trying to maintain your heterosexual privilege. Do you think that uh, men should be elders only? That's because you're trying to preserve your male privilege. And it goes on and on. Now, the primary concern for people who've embraced contemporary critical theory is not appealing to reason or to argument or evidence or even to scripture. Their primary concern is unearthing and deconstructing the hidden motives behind those truth claims and then ignoring them. Third, critical theory assumes an adversarial relationship between different identity groups that is profoundly antithetical to Christianity. Critical theory depends crucially on differentiating between victims and victimizers, right? Men versus women, people of color versus whites, etc. If there were some fundamental identity marker that unified people across lines of race, class, and gender, that would deeply undermine the entire project of critical, uh, contemporary critical theory, right? Well, unfortunately, or fortunately, Christianity gives us not one but three such ideas. All human beings share solidarity in first creation, second sin, and third redemption. All of us, number one, are made in God's image equally and therefore worthy of dignity and possessing a value. Right? That unites people across all these lines. We're all, number two, fallen in sin. We're all ruined and rebellious against God and therefore share a solidarity, what Wolf calls a solidarity in sin. And third, we all need the same savior. We all need redemption found only in Christ. So those three doctrines of human solidarity deeply undermine racism and sexism and classism and critical theory, and for exactly the same reasons. Finally, hegemonic power. Contemporary critical theorists tend to problematize and reject hegemonic power. They see singular narratives and singular sets of values as oppressive. Is that a problem? Well, yes, because the Bible is nothing but one gigantic, colossal, hegemonic discourse from start to finish. It's a story about how God justifies his own complete sovereignty and power and goodness. It tells one true story of religion, one true story of morality, one true story of sexuality, one true story of gender, and so forth. The critical theorists, that is wildly oppressive. So do you see why we can't possibly marry this singular narrative given to us by the Bible with the approach of contemporary critical theory? It's not going to work. So I hope I've shown you that uh, you can't fuse these two different worldviews. It's never going to work. And it's, it, it, to the extent that you embrace contemporary critical theory, you'll have to abandon the basic principles of Christianity and vice versa. Okay, um, I'm going to go ahead and skip the next section. It's all online. I know that we're trying, I have like three hours of material here. Uh, if you want to read more about this, the entire talk and the text is on my website. Um, but I'll skip this for now. I, I just want to point out, I think the way that critical theory really first gets people to subscribe to it is not through them reading Horkheimer or reading Marcuse or, or reading D'Angelo even. I think they start by hearing slogans that sound good, like, we should never challenge lived experience. That invalidates people's humanity. They say, yeah, right on. But they don't think through the logical implications of those slogans. So I've shown four here. I'll just say the slogans. We should never challenge lived experience. We need to liberate our theology from privileged groups. We should dismantle all structures which perpetuate privilege. And finally, we should promote diversity within the church. Now, all four of those, I'm going to argue, I would argue, they all capture some truth. That's why they're attractive. There's some elements of truth in those statements. And yet, if you follow them to their logical conclusions, they conflict with deeply, deeply important Christian doctrines. Okay, let's skip to this very sensitive section, which is critical theory within the church. Now, my goal here is not to call out any Christian leaders. I want to, I, that's why I've removed all of the personal information from uh, the people quoted here. I don't want to get distracted. I don't want us to think, oh, so-and-so is bad, say with from so-and-so. That's not my point. My point is to show you that critical theory is not just a problem out there in the culture or even out there in the progressive Christian church. 
but actually in here within conservative evangelicalism. Okay, let's start with some examples. Uh, last year for Lent, this, um, this Christian speaker who had spoken at Urbana, the big InterVarsity Missions Conference, she's written for Christianity Today. She has 23,000 Twitter followers. She wrote a series entitled Christ Our Black Mother. She said she wanted to dive deeper into an intersectional exploration that examines both God's blackness and femaleness on the cross. Uh, on Facebook, she posted this list to, for whites of 10 ways that they can actively reject their white privilege. Number 10 said to whites, recognize that you're still racist no matter what. Now, when some of her followers actually objected to number 10, she wrote this in response. Y'all who are concerned about number 10 need to educate yourselves on what it means to be racist. D'Angelo's, what does it mean to be white, is a good place to start. Look at all the likes and loves, by the way. And that's Robin D'Angelo, who is probably the most popular, well-known critical race theorist in the U.S. right now. I quoted from her repeatedly, quite previously. Okay. Next, this is a Christian racial reconciliation group. I was featured in Christianity Today. The founder of this group wrote a book it was actually one of Christianity Today's top 11 books of 2019. Um, the group has 24,000 members. This document is from the group entitled Whiteness 101. It says things like this. Don't demand proof of a person of color's lived experience or try to counter their narrative with the experience of another person of color. Uh, provide space. This is to whites, by the way. It's written not to everybody, which is for white members. Provide space for people of color to wail, cuss, or even yell at you. Um, don't get defensive when you're called out for any of these other behaviors. When a person of color tells you that your words, tone, behavior are racist, oppressive, triggering, you stop. Don't try to explain yourself. Uh, don't leave in a huff. Remain cognizant of the dynamics of white fragility. That's a phrase coined by D'Angelo. And take note of how it usually shows up in you. And again, that document cites Robin D'Angelo. Here's another, uh, there's a web page. It's from a Christian author who's written for the ERLC, uh, for USA Today, and who has 18,000 Twitter followers. On her website, she identifies male privilege, abled privilege, cis-hetero privilege, citizenship status privilege, and so on, as things produced by societal systems of oppression and supremacy. Now, she has a recommended reading list for kids ages one through eight. These are like board books that includes books like this. A is for activists, which includes lines like LGBTQ, love who you choose, and T is for trans, trust in the truth, the he, she, they, that is you. Another book recommended was Pride, the story of Harvey Milk and the Rainbow Flag. Now, she recommends these books for kids alongside books about slavery and the civil rights movement. Why? because racism, sexism, classism, heterosexism, and transgender oppression are all forms of oppression. It's seen that they're all qualitatively the same. Okay, here's another. Uh, this is a pastor, an author with almost 100,000 Twitter followers. He writes, as white men move from an entitled majority and our country is increasingly led by women and people of color, a future without nuclear weapons feels within reach. A world where the weapons of colonialism and subjugation are confined to museums seems plausible. Help us, Lord. Now, again, why, why would you single out someone's gender or race as a reason that, man, they're the worst? Nuclear weapons, they're all the fault of white men. Well, because they're the canonical oppressor group. And these other marginalized groups have a better access to social reality and, and are somehow inherently more likely to divest themselves and use power equitably. That's the reasoning, at least. Um, here's an evangelical author with 16,000 Twitter followers. This is from a book he wrote uh, recently. He writes, he's a white male. He writes, my problem as a white man was that I didn't know how to live in skin. Racial blindness was in my DNA. Racism isn't only part of who we've been. It is in ways we don't even comprehend who we are. White people suffer from a malady called shriveled heart syndrome. Um, here is an author, uh, this is interesting, this is a talk, this is from a talk, given to a women's conference on racial reconciliation, and as an evangelical women's conference on racial reconciliation. She was invited to speak. In this woman's talk, she said the following, whiteness is wicked, it is wicked, it is rooted in violence, it is rooted in theft and plunder, it's rooted in power and in privilege. Now, after the talk, people rightly pointed out that she was using the word whiteness as a synonym for white supremacy. 
And that's, that's true. And given that's the case, this, this sentence, this, this passage is less problematic, right? Because white supremacy is indeed wicked and rooted in violence. That's true. However, people didn't necessarily go and listen to the other things she said after her talk. She said other things too. Listen to this. Describing her talk, she says, I went into that racist space and did what I was supposed to do, tell the truth as a fully embodied black woman. Neither the conference director nor her racist organization are sorry for their mistreatment. Then in an interview later, she said this about her talk. Why is she going in there to this evangelical uh, space for, on racial reconciliation? She's going in with a mission on two ends to affirm black people and to speak the truth about racism to white people and give them a way of change or transformation, repentance from racism through the power of the gospel. Remember, she's saying this space that she's in, the evangelical space, the Women's Conference on Racial Reconciliation is a racist space that needs repentance. Then finally, she says, me entering into a white racist space is an act of love because this work is very dangerous. I'm putting myself, my life on the line every time I do that. This is not a game. My life is actually on the line when I go in. I take that risk. Now, that does indeed sound pretty delusional, right? Does she really believe that when she's invited to speak at an evangelical women's conference on racial reconciliation, her life is actually in danger? But it makes more sense if she believes that she is oppressed that all white people, even her brothers and sisters in Christ, are oppressors. Another example. Uh, this is a major organization, a Christian organization, that specializes in issues of race. And for Black History Month last year, they did a series of tweets which would cite scripture, but would apply the passages not to the church, to God's people, but to the BBIPOC community. That's the Black, Brown, and Indigenous People of Color community. They're taking passages that apply to the church. They would apply it not to the church at large, but to the BBIPCO community. Uh, one of the examples said this, pray that God would protect BBIPOC who are gender, sexual, and or religious minorities, that he would fill them with hope, joy, and peace. And it cites Deuteronomy and Romans. So here, they're applying scripture not even just to some ethnic community or ethnic communities, but even to religious minorities, meaning Muslims or Hindus who are part of this ethnic community, okay? The founder of this organization, speaking about critical race theory and actually speaking about Resolution 9, which many of you know about, uh, the SBC's resolution about CRT and intersectionality, he said, it's a, he said, actually, he agreed, he admitted that he found it useful. But he said it's a made-up problem. The real problem that led to the passage of Resolution 9 is white fragility, the phrase coined by critical race theorist Robin DiAngelo. The same, uh, the same founder had this interesting exchange a few weeks ago. He said this on Twitter, whiteness wants black people to accept our blackness as a source of inferiority, but it hates when we embrace our blackness as a source of empowerment. Some random person on Twitter asks, well, what's your evidence for saying that? He quote tweeted that question and said this in response to that query, what's your, what's your evidence for that? So whiteness also wants to invalidate your experiences and insights about race under the veneer of detached empirical, in quotes, empirical inquiry. It tries to, to burden black people to prove our own oppression rather than holding oppressors accountable. And finally, uh, a few years ago, Tim Keller wrote a New York Times op-ed piece on why neither political party perfectly aligns with Christian values. In response to Keller's piece, this is an evangelical author with about 25,000 Twitter followers. She wrote a long response that said this, Tim Keller has no authority to teach on justice, none. He is a rich white man whose ministry targets rich people. Um, the only ones with divine authority to define the, the bounds of oppression are the oppressed themselves. The only person in all of scripture who came close to the social location of Tim Keller was Pontius Pilate. Keller has no authority to speak or teach on justice. Okay. Uh, these are serious issues. Can we agree on that? Ideas have consequences. The bigger the idea, the bigger the consequence. We're just now beginning to see the cascading implications that the acceptance of contemporary critical theory will have on the life and health of the church. People are being eaten alive out there, guys. 
You, you cannot remain silent and hope it all just blows over. If you are an elder or a leader or a pastor, you are called to shepherd the flock. And that means you need to explicitly repudiate these ideas. And if you don't, you are neglecting, you are ignoring, you are rebelling against God's role for you. And in fact, I would argue this. As Christians, all of us are called to exercise discernment and care and care for our brothers and sisters in Christ. These are terrible, dangerous ideas. We can't just be afraid of being called a bigot or racist or a sexist by pointing out this is really, really bad for your theology. Okay. So, at this point, all the conservatives in the audience are yelling, amen, preach it, brother. You know, that's so wonderful. You're, you know, you're, you're owning the libs. Well, it's your turn next. Are you ready to be triggered? Uh, because, I, you know, I want us to achieve dialogue. I don't want to go in there guns blazing and own people. I, I want us to be able to talk through this as brothers and sisters in Christ. I think we need to unequivocally condemn these ideas and reject them as a worldview and say these are terrible and dangerous and incompatible with Scripture. But we have to be sensitive to the concerns that lead people to embrace them. There's a reason why they're so appealing. So what are some suggestions about how we can get to a better conversation? All right, number one, we need to acknowledge and fight racism. Let me speak very plainly. People are embracing these ideas in large part because they are rightly concerned about the wickedness of racism. Listen carefully. If you are concerned, therefore, about how dangerous these ideas are, if you are worried like I am about their impact on the church, then the worst thing you can possibly do is to ignore or minimize racism or sexism or any form of injustice. Okay, so because of that, you're about to get a crash course in the history of race and racism and white supremacy in history and in America today. Let's start with lynching. Listen to this description of the lynching of Luther and Mary Holbert. <clears throat> The lynching was planned for a Sunday afternoon after church, so a larger crowd could gather. The murderers strategically chose their location for maximum intimidation of the black populace. More than a thousand people showed up to gawk at the lynching of Luther and Mary Holbert. The lynchers tied up the Holberts and commenced with the most fiendish torture. That's quoting from a newspaper, by the way, of the time. First, the white murderers cut off each of the fingers and toes of their victims and gave them out as souvenirs. Then they beat the bodies of Luther and Mary so mercilessly that one of Luther Holbert's eyes dangled from his socket. The most excruciating punishment uh, consisted in the use of a large corkscrew in the hands of some of the mob. The instrument was bored into the flesh of the man and woman in the arms, legs, and body, and then pulled out. They, pulled Mary, they burned Mary first so that Luther could see his beloved killed. Then they burned him. Woods Eastland, who led the mob that lynched the Holberts, did face charges in the murders, but his acquittal was a foregone conclusion. After the all-white jury found him innocent, he hosted a party on his plantation to celebrate. According, according to the Tuskegee Institute, 3,446 blacks and 1,297 whites were lynched between 1882 and 1968. And by the way, many of the whites that were lynched were lynched defending blacks from being lynched. How dare you defend a black person will kill you too. Here's a picture of the aftermath of the 1980, 19, sorry, 1898 Wilmington race riot, Wilmington, North Carolina, two miles down the road, in which a group of white businessmen instituted a violent coup d'etat to overthrow the local fusionist government and reestablish white super, uh, superiority, white control of the city. They wanted white supremacy to reign, and they got rid of the people that were keeping them from doing that. They burned down the office of the black newspaper, The Daily Record, and forced the city's Republican governor and aldermen to resign at gunpoint. Did you know that we had a, a violent coup d'etat in the U.S. 100 years ago? I did not know that until about a few months ago. And they're, they're posing in front of the burned-out building. Here's a picture from the Tulsa Massacre of 1921. Dozens and possibly hundreds of people were killed, most of them black. White mobs burned down 35 square blocks of the Greenwood District, which had been known as Black Wall Street, and was the wealthiest black community in the nation. It's estimated that 10,000 blacks were left homeless. Now, why mention all of this? Isn't it, oh, it's all in the past. Why dredge up this ancient history? Okay, 
Who is on the left right there? On the left is Ruby Bridges, the six-year-old who received death threats and had to be escorted by U.S. Marshals for integrating her all-white elementary school in New Orleans. On the right is Ruby Bridges today. She's 65. This is not all ancient history, guys. Um, Dr. Eric Mason tells a, a story about his own father who, in his book, Woke Church. Uh, his own father, Mason's father, was falsely accused of stealing from his dry cleaner where he worked, and a group of white men dragged him from his house and beat him so badly that his mother, Mason's grandmother, couldn't recognize him. Mason heard that story growing up. Naturally, it was his dad. And in his book, he reflects on this episode and how it colored his uh, experiences. He says this, he says this, these and other experiences colored how I was raised to deal with whites, whether Christian or not. Just as my father's experiences impacted my perceptions about race, so my perceptions, perceptions will mark those of my three sons. This is how it works. One generation's pain and fears are passed on to the next. It doesn't mean that we must repeat the sins of racism and bigotry of the past, but it does mean they impact us in some way. Now, let's be honest. I know that some of us get nervous when people start talking about the U.S.'s sordid racial history. We worry, sometimes rightly, people are trying to manipulate us. But if that fear is preventing you from even talking about race or history at all, you need to get over it. I'm not saying any of this to argue that you have to repent because you're white. That's not how repentance works in the Bible. I'm saying we have to learn to, uh, to empathize with people that are different from us. It's not about assigning guilt or coercing behavior. But what about today? Is this all in the past? It's, we're, not, we're, not, we're in a post-racial society finally. No, that's not true. Look at data from job interviews. Here's a study um, looking at the interview callbacks. From, it's a matched pair study. They found pairs of men, one white and one black, and they matched them up in terms of their experience, their, um, how, how, well, how articulate they were, how, how well-spoken they were. They matched them up, so the same. They even matched them according to physical attractiveness. I don't know how they did that. They did, okay? So these are two identical men, except for their race. They sent them out to apply for entry-level jobs. What they found was that whites had a 20% higher response rate when they had a criminal record than for blacks with no criminal record, okay? Well, that's just one study, right? No. Here's a meta-analysis of two dozen hiring studies. Also, this is done by David Pager. What they found was that on average, in all these studies are carefully controlled, well-designed studies. They found that whites had a 40% higher response rate than blacks, and that hasn't changed for three decades. Okay, that's today. But what about personal attitudes? Well, they've improved, certainly. But in 2013, 16% of whites and 4% of blacks did not approve of interracial marriage between whites and blacks. Another survey. Again, things have gotten better. But in 2016, 14% of non-blacks would oppose a relative marrying a black person. This is another one. This is amazing. 28% of Republicans and 12% of Democrats think interracial marriage is not just unwise in some vague sense, but is morally wrong. Okay? You say, well, surely, surely Christians wouldn't exhibit that kind of ideology or that kind of racism, right? Last figure. In 2008, 34% of self-identified evangelicals, white evangelicals, would oppose the interracial marriage of a close relative. Bradley Wright, who's a Christian sociologist, notes that among evangelicals, we see no evidence of prejudicial attitudes decreasing with church attendance. In other words, church-going evangelicals have the same levels of opposition to interracial marriage. Now, time out. Does that seem crazy to you? It seems crazy to me, okay? I, I became a Christian in grad school. I, I, I've been to very conservative evangelical churches, and the Christians I've met are the most loving, gentle, caring, compassionate people that I've ever met, okay? But listen carefully. My experience is anecdotal. If I have to choose between my anecdotal experience on the one hand and the data on the other, I choose the data every time, okay? These data show that racial biases and discrimination persist to this day. If your church is anything like the national average, then about one in six whites in the pews and around one in 25 blacks oppose interracial marriage. Serious question. Do the people in your church understand that racism is a sin? 
have they really understood the implications of the idea that all people are made in God's image, they were all fallen in sin, they were all brothers and sisters in Christ? Do they know that? Look, if, if you, you owe your word, you're worried that if you go into church and talk about racism, you'll be accused of virtue signaling. Aren't you more worried that people won't repent of their sin? Hmm? What do you care more about? Aren't you worried that people are embracing a false and unbiblical and wicked anthropology? I'm not asking you to go into church and scream, everyone's a racist. I'm not asking you that. I'm just asking you to take this issue seriously. Never let anyone make you feel ashamed or prevent you from speaking against error with scripture, whether it's the error of critical theory or the sin of racism. Don't dismiss it. Talk about it. Second, what can we do? We can read broadly. Stop watching TV. Just, just stop. It's shallow. It's sensationalistic. If you want to learn about a topic like race or sexuality or gender, anything, any topic, read authors from a diverse background like these. You say, diverse background? These guys are all black men. Sure, because black men all have the same idea about race, right, guys? Wrong, guys. You know, people are individuals with their own ideas. They're not the avatars of some collectivist group, okay? Uh, so you need to read broadly ideologically. Don't assume that because the authors you read are multicolored, they're intellectually diverse. That's no guarantee. In fact, in reading broadly intellectually and ideologically will help you read critically. Because if all the authors you read are saying exactly the same thing, you don't have to think. You can just accept what they're saying. But if you're reading authors with different ideas, different opinions, you'll have to ask yourself whose beliefs are better supported by scripture and evidence, right? So read broadly, read diverse, ideologically diverse authors. Recommendations. Brian Stevenson's Just Mercy. Um, it's not a book about policy or laws or what we ought to do to fix the injustices in our system. Just a really, really powerful, moving story. Stories about injustice. I mean, I cried like a baby while I was reading it in the airport. But anyway, um, the, but, but it, it, if nothing else, it will spark great conversations about the reality of injustice in the U.S. today. So I really recommend it. It's, very, it's full of hope and re it's redemptive. It's, one, it's really good. Um, second recommendation is uh, George Yancey's Beyond Racial Gridlock. George is a friend of mine. Um, but I don't think we agree on everything with regard to race, but it's, it's really a gospel-centered way to think about having these conversations. It's rooted in the recognition that we're all sinners and need the gospel. It's rooted in a, a posture of active listening where you really are dialoguing, not just talking at someone. So I recommend that book too. Um, and finally, what do, we, what do we need to do? My, my, my real concern in all of this discussion about social justice, and racism, and sexism is that we put the gospel first. Um, why? We should ask two, two big questions. The first question is this. Is social justice a Christian imperative? Does God command it? Is it a moral obligation? Is it something that we ought to do? Now, let's ignore the very important question of what social justice is. Let's put that aside. Let's assume, for the sake of argument, that whatever it is, it is absolutely a Christian imperative. It is something that we ought to do. Okay. Second question, is the gospel an imperative or an indicative? Is it a statement of what we ought to do or a statement about what God has done in Christ on our behalf? There's only one right answer. It is an indicative statement. The gospel is a statement about what God has done for us in Christ, not a statement about what we ought to do as our moral obligations. And it is so crucial to keep that right. Why? You know, am I saying we shouldn't live justly and love mercy? Of course not. We should love our neighbors as ourselves. We should seek justice. We should care for the vulnerable. But we have failed to do that. We are condemned as lawbreakers and deserve God's wrath. The gospel is the good news that in spite of our failure to live justly, Jesus came to save us, the righteous for the unrighteous, the just for the unjust. When we trust in him, God counts us as if we are righteous and gives us the power and the desire to follow his commands, but we dare not mingle the glorious, it is finished declarations of the gospel with the do this and live imperative of God's moral law because the gospel saves. 
the law condemns. We can't lose that distinction. And second, the gospel is central for non-Christians as well. You know, contemporary critical theory insists that our fundamental moral duty is working for the liberation of the oppressed. So a lot of people today feel extremely confident in their own righteousness. Why? Because they tweet the right tweets, they, they share the right posts, they vote for the right candidates, they attend the right rallies. They care about social justice. They care about the poor. But listen, seeking the liberation of oppressed groups is not our only moral duty. God cares about the poor, but he also cares about sexual purity. He, cares about oppre he hates oppression, but he also hates idolatry. Non-Christians, especially those who've been influenced by critical theory, need to hear that truth. None of us has the clean hands and the pure heart that God desires, and all of us have fallen short of God's standards. It doesn't matter whether we're the wealthiest, most wicked, most unjust oppressor in the, in the world, or the poorest, most degraded oppressed person, we're all sinners in need of a savior. We cannot risk ambiguity on this issue because it's the gospel of the finished work of Christ on the cross that creates the church, that transforms hearts, that changes oppressors into servants, and that breaks down the dividing wall of hostility between Jew and Gentile, slave and free, male and female, black, white, Hispanic, and Asian. We need to keep the gospel pure and keep it central because if we lose the gospel, we lose everything. Okay, so I'd like to thank my wife who is working in the ER right now um, and it does a great job supporting me doing all of this miserable work on critical theory. Um, thank you to my co-author, Patrick Sawyer, in the audience here and my lifting buddy, Michael, is here along for the ride. Um, we've written a lot of articles that might be helpful like I said, I skipped a lot of material because I'm under the gun, um, but we have a Gospel Coalition article, an Icon article, a Ratio Christi booklet. It's about 32 pages long um, about contemporary critical theory. This talk, all of the text and all of the slides can be found here, shenvyapologetics.com slash defend19. That's from last year. And I'm on Twitter at, at Neil Shenvy.